Hi there, I'm Nicole Philippone, autistic advocate and author. Welcome to my channel. For those who are new here, I talk all about autism, SPD, and related conditions in my videos. But more than just spreading awareness and identifying challenges, I try really hard to focus on solutions and strategies whenever I can. So I really hope you find my content not just valuable, but also practical in terms of what you can do with the information I share here. And if this isn't your first time on my channel, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you so, so, so much. Okay, so today we're going to be doing things a bit differently. If you've seen my other videos, you know that I usually touch on subjects at somewhat of a high level. You might have seen my very first video called Let's Talk About SPD. Well, this one is a deeper dive into SPD, like a super duper, duper deeper dive, particularly coming from the perspective of a parent with sensory kiddos especially if that parent is sensory themselves, like I am. Earlier this week, I met with Carla Pretorius from Ames Global. I'll link to her channel below so you could check out her content as well. And we talked about how to coexist in the same space as loved ones who have conflicting sensory needs. This is an interview style video and it's chock full of strategies. So stick with both of us as we break it down. Hi, Nicole from Sensory Stories. It is lovely mm -hmm. to see you here. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, I wanted to ask you to introduce yourself to the listeners, but I will ask you a bit more of a specific question. What is your interest in autism and related conditions? Um, first of all, pleasure to be here, Carla. Um, you're just a wonderful person. I love talking to you. Um, so I am autistic and um, my goal with my platforms is just to spread as much awareness as possible, connect dots for people, um, people who are neurodivergent and don't necessarily know or people who know and they're not sure how to deal with their life challenges. So um, that's my interest in it. Awesome. Thank you so much again and thank you for the compliment. Um, I know that you 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 have a presentation that you wanted to share that I'm really excited to learn about. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, this is something that I have talked about before, but I would love to be able to put this out on YouTube because I just think it would it would be a great uh, topic for basically anyone to consume and to learn about. And that is um, the ability to coexist in a space with other people who have conflicting sensory needs, um, which is a topic for me that is very important because um, in our in my household with five people, we basically all have different needs. <laughs> so um, what I'm going to talk about today is not just why that is, but what can be done, what strategies that we can employ to make kind of everybody be okay. Um, and this has nothing to do with how much you love a person. It just has to do with your sensory um, triggers. Um, that doesn't, you know, it's not anyone's fault. It's not your fault. It's not their fault. It's just the reality of the situation. So what I want to talk about today is um, strategies you can use so that everybody gets their needs met. It's an awesome topic. I've, I'm quite sensory sensitive, so I'm really excited to hear about it so that I can explain to the people in my house how to manage me better. <laughs> <laughs> I am very sensory sensitive as well. So um, I, I and I talk a lot on my platform about sensory anxiety, because to me, mm -hmm. when my sensory um, when my sensory sensitivities are triggered, I have massive anxiety. Um, I wrote. Um, I wrote an article about my experience with basically sensory anxiety leading to me having a uh, stress-induced heart attack. It was called stress-induced cardiomyopathy. And that was from sensory anxi anxiety over the course of a period of time that just didn't go away um, and got worse. So um, one oh, of the yeah. many reasons why it's so imperative that if you are sensory sensitive and you have sensory anxiety that you work on addressing the triggers 
Yeah, I'm really sorry to hear about that. Uh, you did tell me this before, but you also wrote a nice blog about this and, and you have some incredible resources, which I will definitely link to this video when we share it, just to kind of help everyone out there because uh, it's, yeah. it's extremely important. Well, thank you. And I'm, yeah, I, I love just getting the information out there and the resources out there. And a lot of my resources are free on my website um, and pretty much everything that we go over today um, that I'm going to be sharing several of those are on my website. So awesome. awesome. Should I jump in and just start talking to the one that I have open? Yes, please. OK. All right. So this resource um, is, is a visualization of how sensory processing works um, in different people. So sensory processing describes the way that the brain reacts to sensory inputs. And then sensory processing disorder is when the brain takes in sensory information, but then doesn't know how to organize it. So those with SPD respond to sensory information differently than the average person. Um, and the average person sometimes is referred to as neurotypical person um, because their brain, their neurotype is typical or average. Um, and so the SPD person responds differently than the average, which is why that their responses seem sometimes inappropriate to those around them. And I use that term in quotes on purpose because it's not inappropriate objectively, but it sometimes can look or seem inappropriate to those that are observing that behavior. So if you look at this, this graphic here, um, there are essentially four types of uh, four neurotypes within the sensory universe. So you have the quote unquote under responsive neurotype where um, there's literally no regist registration or registering of the sensory input at all and therefore no response to it. Then you have the sensory seeker neurotype and that person is registering the sensory input as not enough. So then they're oftentimes uh, responding by seeking out more of that sensory input. Then you have the uh, neurotypical neurotype um, and that is just they register it normally, normally, again in quotes. And then finally, the sensory sensitive neurotype. And this is where you register it as too much and therefore have a fight, flight, or freeze response to the input. In my personal case, I usually have a flight response, which is why I call myself a sensory avoider, but not every sensory sensitive person is an avoider. So that's why I have it as sensory sensitive on this graphic. All right. So um, moving on to the next one here, um, this is a, a visualization I put together that shows some examples of how SPD can manifest. And it's really important to note that one person can have a mix of the responses. You, you don't have to be only one or only the other. And I get this is one of the main questions that I get when it comes to SPD. Can you be both? Absolutely. You can 100% be both. Um, and so the responses have to do with, you know, all of the sensory, uh, all of the, from your senses. So, you know, your sight, your sound, the smell, the texture, all these things. Um, and what can happen is that based on the specific circumstances of what's happening, a person can respond differently. And also even depending on the way a person is experiencing in, internally what's going on, um, emotionally what's going on with them, they might have a different response as well. Now, the difficulty coexisting with individuals who have conflicting sensory needs is sometimes tied to sensory seeking behaviors, triggering sensory sensitive responses. But there are many ways that conflicting needs can play out. You can have a sensory seeker triggering a sensory sensitive person, but you can also have someone with mixed sensory needs triggering someone else with mixed sensory needs. And you can even have someone who is a sensory sensitive person triggering someone else who's sensory sensitive. And this happens a lot in my house. Uh, so the important point if, with this topic is that at the core of it, it's all about working together to make sure everyone's needs are met. That is literally the point of all of this. So um, before I move on, I just want to note that conflicting needs can interfere with any relationship. 
It, it can be a relationship between peers at school. It could be between a teacher and a student. Um, for the purposes of this conversation, I'm just going to be focusing on like the household family relationships and strategies that can be helpful within that context. So I'm not going to deep dive into this um, visualization, but hopefully people can pause the video and read through it or download it and have it on their end. So moving on, you see a list of sensory triggers, particularly ones that are caused by others as opposed to triggers related to the environment that others don't necessarily have control over. So um, that's the first graphic. In the second graphic, you see a list of sensory sensitive responses to those triggers, like kicking, hitting, covering ears, like shutting down, irritability, anger. What's most important to understand is that the responses are the result of the triggers. Understanding this is what makes it possible for you to problem solve rather than react with your own triggered responses. So imagine um, you have a kid who is in a meltdown mode, something is overwhelming them. So they're in a state of sensory overload and their overload triggers you. And now how are you going to help them? It's really hard to help them when you are triggered. But if you're able to think from a problem solving state, like my child is having a reaction to something. What is that thing? And how can we get that thing removed? Basically, the trigger removed. Then um, that's how you, you're able to uh, handle, essentially be there to support them and then your, yourself ultimately as well. When we have triggered responses as parents, we tend to use reactive measures or behavioral strategies to address the behaviors. So it's like, for example, taking something away, which is negative reinforcement or giving them something they want, which is positive reinforcement. And this would be to motivate them to change their behavior. But these methods are rarely effective because the underlying issue is sensory. And if the triggers aren't addressed, the behaviors won't change. For example, say a child is having a meltdown because they're overstimulated by their sibling who's being loud. If you threaten to take away their screen time because they're melting down, that won't result in a behavior change because the trigger is still there. On the other hand, if you focus on the overstimulation, recognizing that it's not within their control and come up with ways to remove the trigger, like asking the child who's being loud to lower their voice because it's causing your sensory sensitive child's distress, uh, that is much more likely to result in a behavior change. For example, the child no longer having the meltdown because they aren't able to self-regulate. So that's kind of an example of how all of that can play out. So um, one thing I want to talk about is strategies that you can use in the moment. So your child is melting down, you're getting overwhelmed and anxious. What do you do? Well, you want to first start with yourself. It's similar to putting that oxygen mask on yourself before your child, if you're in a plane and you're, there's turbulence or something. Uh, you need to first focus on yourself before you can help your child. Um, so you need to do whatever you can to calm yourself down and reduce your own anxiety in the moment. Then once you have your problem solving hat on, you can go through the exercise in the graphic I'm going to move on to now and identify the trigger that has created the sensory overload and then come up with solutions based on the situation at hand. So in this graphic, there are um, three examples of things you can do to get their needs met. Um, the three main things that I've employed in my whole entire life, it used to be kind of instinctually, but over the course of time, I started to like Put it into a framework and really understand what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. Um, the three main things you can do is escape the trigger, drown out the trigger, and then if those two things aren't a possibility, then you can try and ask for an accommodation and essentially change the environment through that. So escaping the trigger is the quickest way to address the need. If, for example, if someone's playing loud music, I can just leave. But if what if I can't leave? So after you say that's not a possibility, then you can try and drown out the trigger in this example with sound. A lot of the time I put my headphones on and I'll listen to my own music because noise counseling headphones only do so much. But if you have music coming in, then then that drowns out the sound. 
Um, so that would be option number two that I find extremely effective. So for example, let's say I'm in the car with my kids and one of my kids, I have a seeker, one of my kids is um, triggering one, my uh, uh, sensory sensitive kid. So having him be able to put on headphones, for example, could potentially solve that problem, although it becomes a lot more complicated when he has visual triggers. <laughs> so I'm not going to go into that right now. But um, thirdly, if neither of those are possible, then you want to ask for an accommodation. And in the case of my kids being in the car, it's basically saying to the seeker, would you mind like not doing that? <laughs> um, please don't hum. Uh, please don't kick the back of my seat, <laughs> um, things like that. And so, but the reason that's the kind of last resort is because it's the most challenging. You need other people to agree and comply. And sometimes it's not possible for them to. My seeker sometimes doesn't control. It's like not really within her control, even though you think it is. Um, but like stimming is sometimes automatic. So it could be very challenging. Um, so options one and two are usually best. But, you know, honestly, sometimes all three of these are impossible. So we're not going to talk about that right now. <laughs> Now, one of the main things you can do is actually to be proactive. You don't want to just look at the situation in the moment and then have to deal with it if you don't have to. So this resource walks through some examples of ways that you can be proactive. So essentially, if you get everyone's needs met beforehand, then the chances of people being triggered are slim to none. So one thing you can do is to educate your child. Um, teach them about SPD so they can advocate for themselves, buy sensory products for a sensory sensitive kid. That would be noise canceling headphones, for example, white noise machines. For me, I sleep with a fan at night like that. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to sleep. Um, stress balls, eye masks, um, if they get if they have visual overstimulation, uh, things like that. And then you want to have a sensory friendly space for them where they can go when they need to escape the trigger. You also want to be mindful of your own noise levels. Like even for me, um, I am very sensory sensitive, but I can be pretty loud. <laughs> um, when I'm on a call like this, for example, I have a really hard time modulating my voice. And my husband's office is right beneath mine. And so he could hear me pretty clearly when I'm talking. So um, I try really hard. He's not home right now, thankfully, because this way I don't have to worry about my modulation. But like when he is home, I do try really hard to be mindful of that. And sometimes I forget. And then he just sends me a text or something. And he, you know, asks me if I can just lower my voice a bit. Um, and then that helps a lot, too. And then there's uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a, a type of talk therapy um, that sometimes helps as well. Okay, moving to the next one. Now, uh, proactive strategies for the sensory seeker. Here are some. Educate your child. If they understand the way their brain works, they can advocate for themselves much, much, much more effectively. My, uh, my daughter one day... Um, this is probably like three or four years ago at this point. She's eight now. So it, it would be when she was five, just entering school, um, banged her head really hard on a table, like really hard. She got a giant welt on her forehead. And the, and the first thing she said to the, the child care person that was watching her at that time was, um, I have SPD <laughs> because SP oh, and, wow. the person, and the person didn't, of course, know what it is, but she tried to explain what it is and basically spd when you're a uh, sensory under sensitive person so sensory seeker is sometimes you have a hard time knowing where your body is in space so you're more likely to have accidents and so um it's just you know the child being able to talk to other people and explain what's going on in words that they can understand too um so that they can make the accommodations if they need to so super important, and that goes for both sensory seekers and sensory sensitive kids. Um, more same as the other one, buy sensory products. Um, sensory seekers are always moving around and stimming, so buy fidget toys and things like that. Um, same as before, sensory friendly space, but in this case, you want to put a whole bunch of you know sensory friendly toys and and gadgets and stuff in it, um, which could be a sensory room. In our house, we have a trampoline. 
with a swing in it. And we also have a, a makeshift ball pit. We took our old uh, pack and play and threw a bunch of ball pit balls in it. <laughs> um, so sensory friendly space where they can go kind of like stim and get their needs met without the risk of hurting themselves or destroying your house. <laughs> um, and then sign up your child for relevant sensory activities. We put our kid, our daughters into gymnastics, for example. Um, and then there's also occupational therapy, which is extremely helpful for sensory seekers specifically. Um, and then uh, there's the, the, another possibility of doing a sensory diet, which is a, more that I won't go, I won't go into that much right now, but I do have some resources on my website that explain that. Reading books. Next one is educating yourself as a parent or a caretaker. There's this book called The Out of Sync Child, uh, amazing book. This is what taught me all the fundamental and everything that I now know about SPD. Um, and I just highly recommend this book. This is what opened my eyes to my own sensory needs and my daughters and my, now my everyone else in the house. Um, and so that is an amazing book. And then there are um, other types of resources, which these are four, books. There are lots others, but the two on top are mine. And the two on the bottom are books that I just love. And they're all sensory related. Um, and these, what's great about these books is that you as a parent can learn from them. It's not just for the kids, but it's also for the kids. So in the case of my books, um, they're always coming from a place of this is not the child's fault. This is not within their control. And, and so therefore don't essentially shame them for any of it, just kind of listen to their needs, ask them what they need, or try and be extra sensitive to their needs. And in my in my two books specifically, I offer strategies to support, some of which include some of the things that I discussed today. Um, so that essentially brings me to the end um, of my presentation. But um, I know we talked about you having some questions for me. So yes, thank you. Great. That's amazing. I absolutely love your books, by the way. I am definitely an Alexander and Alex fan <laughs> because it reminds me of myself, I guess. <laughs> yeah, um, same here. <laughs> and will you, you will also be able to share where people can find these books, right? Yeah, so NicolePhilipponeAuthor.com um, is where I have those books. I also have a new book out now called Paisley the Perfectionist, A Generalized Anxiety Disorder Story. And GAD is extremely common in autistic kids and also sensory kids. So um, there's an overlap there in terms of the needs and the GAD challenges are different than the sensory challenges so that's why it has its own book awesome i i see this with my clients that i'm working with the adults uh, neurodivergent adults there's always an element of anxiety um paired with either asd or um, adhd or comorbid conditions so it's really important to kind of show people that there are different ways to manage each of those yeah um so how do I determine what sensory needs my child has? So how, how do I do that as a parent? Um, so I understand this question because when I first got into this space, it's like, where do I even start? Um, the book, The Out of Sync Child actually goes into this in such great detail. Like it's like checklist after checklist after checklist. And it's, it's amazing if you want a really thorough kind of understanding. On my website, I have a couple of checklists that um, would be kind of a much higher level simplified version of what the out of sync child discusses, although I should put a disclaimer on that and say they are not meant to be diagnostic tools. They are meant to kind of point you in the right direction. So if you see a lot of check marks on the sensory sensitive checklist and really not very many on the sensory seeker checklist, then you most likely have a sensory sensitive kiddo. Um, vice versa it could be the case too. And you can find that your child has um, check marks in both. And that's also very common, like I said earlier. So um, yeah, just kind of looking through what the common behaviors are for the different types of sensory kiddos and then um, getting a decent understanding of where your kid is and then talking to a professional maybe an occupational therapist that specializes in sensory integration. 
Absolutely. Yeah. So that's that's a good point you make. Not every occupational therapist does mm -hmm. specialize in that. Um, there are sensory clinics as well. So we took our daughter to a sensory clinic up the road and they were amazing. But there are occupational therapists that are certified. My mother is actually an occupational therapist who was certified at one point in um, sensory integration. And so they, they definitely exist. That's awesome. That's where you get a lot of your information as well for the books, I guess. It is. She's my <laughs> subject matter expert. Um, she makes sure that my content is 100% on point. Mm -hmm. um, and this because I don't have a degree in this. I have lived experiences and I have research that I have done. But um, I take I take great pains to make sure that I'm talking to someone who does have the education and background on these subjects so that when I'm putting books out in front of kids, I'm not risking anything being even slightly not accurate. Yeah, but that's a great combination, that lived experiences and you've got your mom and you've got your yeah. kids and you yeah. can bring them all into this. Um, and as a parent, I love the story about your daughter advocating, self-advocating for herself. Um, mm -hmm. Well, that's basically saying it <laughs> twice. But self-advocating her sensory needs um, yeah. when she bumped her head. I hope it wasn't a big bump. But what would she you say? Was she was okay? <laughs> she was okay, but she uh, her school picture from that year, it was like the day after. <laughs> Not one week in oh. <laughs> oh, that's Murphy's Law. It's always like that, isn't it? Yeah. Um, it's like when you have the big pimple and you have to take a photo for your website or something. Exactly. Um, <laughs> how do parents help? I know you also said that they can help their kids self-advocate by teaching them their specific needs. Yeah. But is there another way? Should they read your books and then will that give them a sense of how to advocate for themselves? I think that... I like this question a lot because it's oh, it's more than just awareness. It's awareness without judgment, and so we want to break the stigma. We wanna we want to make it not seem like there's something wrong with a person who has these needs. There isn't anything wrong. It's just different brain wiring. Um, why I why I feel like maybe they should read my books is because the way in which I wrote those books was literally meant to not put any stigma around it, around SPD in general. And so one of the reasons I think kids really appreciate my books is because they're very validating. They, it's, you know, especially my last one, which is about generalized anxiety disorder. My daughter helped me write that book. And um, I'm, I'm, yeah, she, she was, she was amazing. Um, but the, the reason um, the kids are so validated is because I'm showing them like, one, this is not just you. Um, two, I understand your struggles. Like this book makes a person who's reading it feel seen and understood. I've had adults tell me that about my books. Like, oh my God, I'm in this book. Well, you told me about that. You said something similar at the beginning. Um, and so um, the point is that there, it's a very validating and like not negative oriented way of spreading education. Um, there are lots of other, there's lots of stuff out there that comes, that tries to spread education, but it comes at it from a much more negative place. And so I think, you know, I'm hoping to put a lot more content into the ether um, that does more and more of similar stuff that I'm doing in my books. And that's what my social media platforms are really all about. It's this is we're not broken. We're just we have different brain wiring. Yeah, exactly. It's so important because then I feel like and I'm I can say this as an assumption, but I feel like the anxiety is also going to decrease then For as sure. we enter Absolutely. adulthood, because we going to we will be able to um, feel that validation recognize mm -hmm. it, experience it, and then really feel that we're accepted. And that's all yeah. we that's all we want as a human being. We just want to be accepted and loved for who we are. Yeah. Um, uh, going over to picky eaters, I know that's a bit of a different topic, but we have quite mm -hmm. a few picky eaters um part of you know as part of our clients and parents are always asking do I have any advice for picky eaters or I know that it is a sensory 
sensitivity, but do you have mm -hmm. any out of the box advice for parents perhaps to help them expand on their diets for their you kids? Betcha. You betcha. I'm going to get awesome. my, I wasn't prepared with this particular graphic, but I have it. So I'm going to open it up. Here we go. So we have sensory eater strategies. Um, so what is a sensory eater? A sensory eater often refuses foods that trigger sensory overload. The triggers can be physical, but they can also be mental. In other words, a child might refuse to eat something just because in the past they had a bad experience with it. So some sensory eaters will choose literally not to eat anything rather than to put food in their mouths that they believe will cause them discomfort or pain. And something really interesting, there is um, something in the brain in sensory sensitive people that literally rewires the um, touch the, the physical touch sense to pain receptors. I have an article I can send you, but oh, literally yes, if you, I, I struggle with soft, gentle touch. Like it, it, it feels bad to me. Um, there's literally something in the, it's something to do with the white matter in the brain and it go, being wired to the pain receptors. So when a kid is refusing to eat something, they literally might be avoiding pain. So it's really important to me. And I'll send you a link to the article. So what does it look like? Um, meal time is really tough. Um, and the kid is just melting down on you a lot. Uh, the kid is screaming or pulling away during meals. Um, maybe they're gagging um, at the sight, smell, or texture of certain foods. Um, they're potentially avoiding foods within a certain food group. Um, and then this one is more of like a developmental example, but if they're not eating 20 foods by the age of age, uh, by age two, then that's an indication that they might be a sensory eater. And there's something called ARFID, which is a, uh, restrictive food disorder. Um, I forget that what it actually stands for, but, um, those people are 100% sensory eaters and they're kind of the extreme version of a sensory eater. And then um, if, the ch if the child isn't gaining weight in accordance with what is healthy for their height and weight, that would be potentially an indication. So strategies. One, don't pressure your, your kid to eat triggering foods. Um, I know you plan on asking me a question about desensitization. I'll bring it up right now. I don't believe in desensitization as someone who struggles with a lot of specific sensory triggers the more I experience those triggers does not impact whatsoever how triggered I am. And mm -hmm. the concept of desensitization is, oh, the more you experience this, the less it will bother you. In my personal lived experience, I can say 100% not going to work for me. Um, so, you know, you have to try other, try other things. Um, some other ways, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. Um, should we go to that question afterwards? Sure. I mean, I okay. Because yeah, the, there was something sure. that I wanted to ask you about the desensitization. Also, I also don't really believe in it. But then, yeah. what happens in this example? What happens if a child just refuses to eat anything, just like the same pasta or fish fingers, the same thing? That's the only thing that they want to eat. So I. It's hard. I think, you know, you need to work with a with a professional at that point. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not every kid is different. Um, I know what works for mine. <laughs> I have extremely picky eaters. And what I have done as a parent is I have literally adjusted every single meal for the specific kid. So I have a general idea. I'm going to make salmon tonight. OK, well, one of them absolutely like hates salmon but will eat it if i give her some kind of thing that i know she really really loves i'll be like if you eat this salmon i'll give you this other thing um and so she's just more inclined but some kids won't do that so i can't you know that just happens to work for us but then more going to that a little bit more is that when i prepare lunches for the kids they're there's all of all of them are different in some way or other um one of them won't eat a certain type of vegetable one of them won't eat a certain type of fruit one of them doesn't like this kind of cheese one of them doesn't like that kind of cheese and so um it's it's just a matter of doing whatever i can to adjust for them um i do 
like I know how important a well-rounded diet is. And so I try to incorporate a fruit and vegetable, a protein and a, and a, if I can make it complex, I will, but not always carbohydrate. Um, but I also know that some kids just won't eat a well-rounded meal. So I, at that point in time, I feel you would just need to bring a professional in, but hopefully not one who believes in desensitization because that's, you know, um, here, I'll give another example. When my son was two, um, he literally wouldn't eat anything but peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. So I got the all natural jelly, all natural peanut butter and whole wheat, uh, 100% whole wheat, like bread rounds. And to me, that was like the best version of that. That would be rel relatively healthy peanut butter is a protein, you know, um, all natural jelly doesn't have added sugar. And um, the type of bread I used was a complex carbohydrate. So to me, that was the best of all world at that time. And he went, he went for two years, basically, that was what he ate. Oh, wow. um, it's good, you good know, taste, though. I love peanut butter jelly sandwiches. <laughs> I love them too, but my daughters will not, they don't like them. They don't like them. So, um, but yeah, it's really very specific. Like I can't give generalities too, too much here. Yeah. This, this, uh, um, resource right here does offer some general suggestions. Like you can let the kid just like play around with it. Maybe they'll taste a little bit. Maybe they will be willing to try a little bit with my kids i can usually negotiate them trying something out if i give them something that they really like and i know not everybody's going to approve of that strategy and that's fine for them this was something that has worked for me um and i really do think that it's very it's very specific to each kid and yeah, i can say that for me each of my kids are different very different yeah. used to food yeah, I think it's very specific. It is. It's so difficult to give general advice to yeah. everyone that's going to work. Um, and I think it's it's like you said, playing with the food, maybe creating something themselves if they like it, making those their their own recipes with the things that they like, yeah. and maybe just adding one thing and yeah. seeing. And so. there's one thing too that work that works with my pickiest eater is that, and she's eight now. Um, if I literally feed, I know this might, people probably, some people are going to judge, but whatever, I don't care. Um, if I help her eat the food, she'll eat the food and there, I don't see a reason not to. So, um, she, that's like, that's how I get her to eat the salmon. Like mm. I'll, I'll literally give you, I'll feed it to you. Okay. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> No, I'll take like one bite. I'll take one bite. Do you take one bite? I take one bite. Yeah, I mean it's different for everyone. Um, but uh, you know, I think number one, what I have on this graphic, I'm pointing there because that's where it's displaying. But um, <laughs> is that don't don't pressure too too much, and don't um, expect desensitization over time. I just don't believe in it. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's perfect. Is that what you wanted to go through with the with the slide? For yeah, so I touched upon the whole sensory eating. Okay, uh, awesome. Um, just speaking, going back to desensitization, because I I had a conversation with Dr. Temple Grandin, and she was telling me this is a different type of sensory sensitivity that she had. She was really scared of the vacuum cleaner in her class uh, when she was a kid, and she was talking to me about um if she was in charge of the sensory monster or you know like the thing yeah. that made all this noise it was yeah. better for her uh, oh, which, yeah. I which i thought was really nice because it's the same for me if somebody plays yeah. music that's mm -hmm. really loud i it feels like i get hurt like physically i'm in pain yeah. whereas if i slowly turn my music up it's okay mm -hmm. because yep. i'm in charge i'm in control so i wonder there's, there's an element to that that we can probably include in, with the picky eating as well, where they are more in charge of what they prepare for themselves. A hundred percent agree. I talk about control a lot on my social media platforms because for me, it's the same exact way. Um, if someone it uh, like if um, if someone is shaking their leg in my peripheral view, I like my chest, I feel like my heart's going to explode out of my chest. But if I'm shaking my own leg, I don't 
feel that way. Um, similar with music, you know, if I have control over the sensory input, if I have control over whatever it is, um, I'm usually not anxious about it. So I completely agree with you. And I'm 100% I'm in agreement that giving uh, the kid choices makes a difference. So I'll give you an example. I just did this yesterday. <laughs> um, I had I was trying to figure out dinner. Dinner is always hard. For, it's always hard. Um, trying to figure out dinner. And so I came up with a, I had three options. I knew none of them were going to be really received too, too well. But those were the three options that I had. One was uh, salmon. Another one was braised beef. And a third was essentially takeout. Um, but the takeout, the, this particular restaurant, the kids you know, one of them loves it. And then the other two are kind of like meh about it. And so I went to the three of them and I said, which would you pick if you could pick something? And so um, they all kind of told me what ended up happening was I had my son was the easiest because he just loves burgers from this place. So we got him a burger and it's just it's very, I would say, relatively healthy. Um, of a, of a food item because you got like the meat and the, and the veggies in it and stuff. And so then um, my daughters were kind of like not really wanting to take out. One of them was like, I guess if it's between those three things, I'll do take out and I'll get mac and cheese. Um, and then my, th my other, my other daughter, by the way, they're twins said to me, um, we, uh, I'm really not, I'm really not feeling the takeout. She's like, I'll do the braised beef. And but normally she's not a big fan of the braised beef, but um, she, so the braised beef is like a pack. It's it, it was a package that was enough to to fit to feed a family. So create making that meal for just her was like, you know, do I do it? Do I not? Ended up doing it. We got the food, and by the way, I got mac and cheese, and I got um a, a side of grilled chicken to make it like with the protein. My daughter, the one who I bought that for, really doesn't like chicken. Why? I don't know. She, I don't, I love chicken, but didn't want the chicken. Um, so she's eating the food and she's like, I don't, this is not, this is not working for me. Um, she goes, mom, can I have the braised beef? And so <laughs> I was like, okay, no problem. I took her grilled chicken. I threw it on my salad <laughs> and um took the mac and cheese and put it in the fridge. And I had a whole family's amount, family ser serving size of the braised beef. So I put the braised beef on, uh, on the plate. Now, all this to say, it wasn't their favorite meal of, of the week, but they ate it. They ate it. They ate, the, the girls ate the braised beef. I made them some toast to go on the side of it. And my son very happily ate his burger. And it's like, it really comes down to their ultimately picking, you know? Um, so I agree with you a hundred percent. Well, I mean, you do have a lot of energy as well because that like making all those different choices and creating it, it's what's needed. But I, I, I do get sometimes it's also quite draining because you have to have the different options and then make this um, well done it, it, well thank you it is definitely draining and like someone might be like oh why did why were you in this situation at all where you had three options that they didn't really want because if you give them the same thing every single day all day they're gonna get tired of it and then you're gonna run out of things to give them so you gotta mm -hmm. give them something you know what i'm saying so there are things that they prefer and that i'll give them but i I just, I really try to avoid giving the same thing all day, every day, simply because I don't want to run out of that as an option. <laughs> you, want so, you want your safe option for those. Sorry? For the, you want your safe option. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Well, that that's basically it. I wanted to ask about your books, but we 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 did speak about that a little yeah. bit. Um, and I would love to share the links for your books too, because I feel like that's needed for everyone to get. Mm -hmm. Um, and then some of your website resources too. So thank you so so much for your time, Nicole. Sure. It is lovely speaking yeah. to you. You're a wealth of information <laughs> and resources, yeah. and I absolutely <laughs> love it. Thank you so much. Sure welcome thank you and uh, thank you for having me of course okay. okay so that's it for this video 
I know this one was quite a bit longer, so please let me know in the comments below if you found it informative and are interested in seeing more content like it. Also, if you did find it valuable, don't forget to give this video a like and subscribe to the channel. And make sure you click the notification bell if you'd like to be notified when I post my next one. Thanks for watching and see you next time. Bye!